Today, only about 9% of all the plastics that we make in the world actually gets recycled. Bioselection is an innovation company that has developed an invention to recycle currently unrecyclable plastics by turning it into valuable chemicals. I met Miranda in our high school, McGee Secondary, in Vancouver at the Recycling Club, in fact. So this uh, involvement with recycling and with sustainable initiatives has always been something that we did together <laughs> from the very start. I have an example here of what we work with. Chemically, these plastics, these polyethylenes, actually look like this, a really long chain of carbons and hydrogens. What we have invented is a chemical process which can change this molecule by breaking these carbon-carbon bonds to create valuable chemicals out of them. So that they can make cleaner products, they can make paints, as well as performance materials. There's at least six million metric tons of plastic bags that our process can actually recycle and create markets for. In the last two years that I have gotten to know Miranda and Jeannie, I have to say it, they're, they're badass. Um, they are doing an amazing job. They are the key to the technology and they're bringing in all the resources to be very successful. Hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline Modoresi Tirani. I'm the host of Between You and Me on HuffPost, and I'm also, like all of us uh, sitting here in this auditorium today, a human being on this planet, which is why I'm so thrilled to be joined by these two fantastic entrepreneurs on stage. I meet two of our mothers of invention, Miranda Wang and Jeannie Yao, and give them another round of applause, I think. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> So, I mean, Miranda, we, we got a sort of taster of what you do, but can you just give us kind of the overview picture of just how bad is the plastics problem that we're facing today? Yeah, today, um, I think what's really difficult for a consumer to understand is that we all believe that when we take a piece of plastic and put it in a recycling bin, that is actually getting recycled. Well, well guess what? It, it doesn't. Um, globally, only 9%, 9% of plastics actually get recycled. The rest, 91%, regardless of whether or not it ends up in a recycling bin, um, is actually going to landfills, it's going to incinerators where it's being burned for some energy, but most of it is being emitted as carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. And there's also a large component of plastics that is leaking into our rivers and oceans because of mismanagement and lack of waste collection infrastructure. Because of this, at the current rate of our insufficient dealing with, uh, with recycling and collection of waste plastics, uh, there will be more plastic than fish in our oceans by weight by 2050. Good that's point. the time, that's the time when if I have a kid in the next couple of years, my kid will be my age at that time. And we're looking at massive extinction and pollution in the oceans. I mean, Jeannie, you, you sort of kind of pioneered the technology behind bioselection and what you do. Can you just kind of explain in, you know, kind of kindergarten's terms or the terms that for me, you know, because I definitely didn't pass science at school. Um, but can you just explain how does the technology actually work? Sure. So it's actually definitely a team effort. We've been working with scientists and, and mentors to build this technology. But on a conceptual level, we're dealing with polyethylene plastic, which is over a third of all plastics produced globally. Polyethylene is, just imagine a long chain of carbon atoms. And um, the reason it doesn't break down the environment is that it's so big that microbes cannot ac access it to break it down biologically. So what we do is we use a chemical method to um, cut this chain into small pieces and uh, these small pieces uh, then become uh, functionalized with with oxygen so that they have uh, very interesting properties so these chemicals that we make out of this plastic are actually precursors to higher value materials uh, including performance materials like your car parts and electronics and textiles and you talk about a circular plastic economy so what do you mean when you're talking about that Miranda 
Yeah, so the circular economy is not a new concept, but in recent years, especially uh, with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and McKinsey's collaboration, it's now become the paradigm for what we must move to um, when we're looking at um, especially technical materials, we call them. Plastics are not natural things. Um, they're invented about over 100 years ago by using fossil fuels as a carbon source, and chemists have figured out ways to piece them together into these synthetic massive uh, uh, polymers. So when we talk about a circular economy, it's the idea of can we take these materials, but if we think of it on more of a chemical level, right, can we take these molecules and fully recycle it in a way so that it fully goes into new products that we can use as opposed to emit up into the atmosphere. Um, so, for example, another way of thinking about this is uh, in nature, when we throw out, you know, a, a compost, uh, you know, banana peel or something, um, nature breaks that down using microbes. It becomes soil, and that soil can raise a new plant. Um, but it's a random event, meaning that it, it's not like one soil particle only becomes the leaf, right? Um, so, so that's how nature composts it. That soil particle can become the roots, the stem. It's a random thing. But that's how nature breaks things down and fully recycle in a circular way. And that's what we need to achieve with synthetic and technical materials as well. But the current way we're doing it with this mechanical recycling process, so all the plastics that's being recycled today is going through a process mechanically broken down and washed and then melted. That's equivalent to taking a tree leaf, cutting it up and gluing it together. Well, you're not going to get a tree leaf again, right? That's, that's why recycling is not working for all of these decades we've been trying. I mean, thank you for explaining on a level I actually understand. I think it's the first science lesson I've ever had where I actually understand it. And, you know, I mean, what you're doing on the surface, it, it isn't something that necessarily sounds glamorous, right? It's waste management. And, you know, when I think when, when I hear about waste management, particularly in New York City, I sort of think of the Sopranos. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, it, it, waste management is typically kind of a male-oriented environment. You know, Jeannie, when you're sort of navigating those male-oriented environments, I mean, is this something that you, you're cognizant of? You know, has, has your gender been an issue when you've been going to meetings and talking mm -hmm. to other executives? We absolutely notice how male dominant the industry is. We've been touring waste plants across the U.S. and other countries, and we notice that you know business owners and operators here are um, you know they're part of family businesses or they're uh, people who don't really have technical backgrounds. They deal with materials, but they don't really know what plastic is, right? They're numbers one through seven, and that's all they know. They don't know what type of polymer it is and why certain things are less recyclable than others. Um, so. Working with them, um, you know, them bring that industry and waste aspect of the knowledge, and then us in reverse giving them more of the technical and scientific knowledge has been a very fruitful exchange. Um, I think something else to mention is that we're not we're at the intersection of two very male dominant industries. Waste on one, one hand and chemicals on the other hand. That is where we will make a lot of our revenue. Um, so the chemical industry is you know, even more so male-dominated. And we've had this experience where we got invited to speak at a technical polymers conference, and it was uh, three other women, aside from ourselves, at a conference of 100 people. And I was presenting there, and, um, you know, people were taking mad notes, but nobody you know, came up and said congratulations or asked interesting questions or wanted to make connections. They were just writing down notes so that they can report this back to their corporates, but didn't, you know, um, psychologically recognize that a woman could be presenting something interesting. Wait, how many of us in this room have had that happen to us in a meeting where we can see the men absorbing what we're saying and then parrot back to us what we've just said? Yeah. I think people, people totally get what you're saying. And, you know, obviously, not only are you both badass women doing what you're doing, but also, you know, you're both very, very young, thankfully, because it means then you've got bright futures ahead of you. But, you know, it feels like, particularly in the environmental industry right now, youth is kind of winning the day. You know, Greta Thunberg, I think, you know, people like that who are really sort of charting a path, thankfully, for us all. Um, you know, how do you, how do you navigate those situations being not just female, but you know, young women. I mean, you, what, you're both, what, 24 and 25? Yeah. Um, I think it is up to the young people 
today to rise up and propose solutions as well as hold the people who have power to be accountable for using the solutions that whether it's the scientist community or others have come up with. Um, we have many solutions out there. There's actually a comprehensive um, guide for how we can combat climate change. There are lots of books, the data is out there. It's about the policy makers, the business e executives, and the everyday people understanding that and adopting that. And having young people, I mean, we're inheriting this, this planet. This is our future. And um, the people who are in their 60s and, you know, a lot of the decision makers are in their 50s and 60s, well, they're not going to need to take all the consequences in to the extent that we will be. So it is really crucial that we understand that every single day, whether you, ch you choose to or not, you are actually building a future. You're, every single person in society is a building block of that. And if we don't choose to build a future that's going to be sustainable for human civilization, then you're choosing one where you're, you're staying with a status quo, which is an extractive and destructive one. Wow. I mean, how inspiring. Join me, please, and give them a massive round of applause. Thank you both so much for sharing your story today. And now I'd like to invite the other 2019 Mothers of Invention honorees, Paige Cheneau, Shubham Issa, and Amanat Anand, onto the stage, as well as Jacqueline Birdsall, the Toyota Senior Engineer in Fuel Cell Vehicle Group, to help us celebrate these fantastic, phenomenal, inspiring women. Big round of applause, please.